the Mount of Olives prophecy, also known as the Olivet Discourse, towers high in the Bible as the most important prophecy ever released. It is the fifth of the discourses in Matthew's glorious gospel and closely relates to the Lord's return. This Olivet prophecy dwells profoundly on the coming of the Messiah, and meritoriously exhorts today's church on the greater need for preparedness. This most central discourse judiciously presents entry into the eternal kingdom of God as the culmination of all righteous and wise preparedness for rapture. In a snapshot, it all began on one material day when the Lord Jesus was walking away from the temple in Jerusalem and towards the Mount of Olives. It was common routine for the Lord to always withdraw from the multitude to the Mount of Olives after ministering to the people. And hence it was during one such occasion that his disciples came up to him, to draw his attention to the beautification and the architectural elegance of the temple of the Lord. However, to their dismay, the Lord responded by saying that a time would come when all the temple buildings would be brought down and not one stone would be left unturned. Out of that came forth the most important prophecy in the entire universe. Introduction The God of Covenant The covenant between God and man has always been documented in a sacred document called a scroll. However, before examining the nature of God's scroll, it is absolutely imperative to explore this most faithful nature of Jehovah as being the God of Covenant. Whenever the Lord God Almighty sends an envoy, he has on each occasion revealed himself in the message of that envoy. In all cases of the messengers sent, Jehovah God has always revealed his own nature through such messengers and the messages they carry. Key among the revelations of God has been his holy nature, coupled with the faithfulness with which he respects his covenant with man. On many occasions God Almighty has proclaimed himself as the God of Covenant, and hence revealed his love and favor to mankind. Right at the onset of creation when the Lord was instituting the covenant of circumcision with Abraham, he vowed to establish his covenant as an everlasting covenant between himself and man, and the descendants of man for generations to come. In that declaration of covenant relationship, Jehovah vowed to be their God and the God of their descendants after them Genesis 17 verse 7. This clearly illustrates that God's commitment to his covenant is always forever. To demonstrate his unrelenting commitment to this vow, the heart of God's covenant promise has been repeated over and over in several instances. This is Jehovah's pledge to be the protector of his people and the one who provides for their well-being including guaranteeing their future. It is incredible that many times man falters faith and yet Jehovah graciously reinforces his pledge with a covenant oath. The archetypal statement of covenant relationship that the Lord God has always employed touches on the heart of man. In many such promises, the Lord has oped that he would give his people the heart to know him that he is the Lord. And he has vowed that they would then be his people, and he their God in the process when they would return to him with all their hearts. The clear indication that a covenant with God involves the heart of man. Just as good figs should be protected and preserved by their owner, so is the church that is willing to transform her ways available to God's protection at this hour. The underpinnings of a sound covenant with the Lord has always been the consecration of man for his purposes. We see that in one such occasion, the Lord declares that he would consecrate the tent of meeting and the altar and would consecrate Aaron and his sons to serve him as priests. As a result of that purging the Lord vowed unto himself that he would dwell among the Israelites and be their God and that they would know that he is the Lord their God who brought them out of Egypt so that he may dwell among them. The Lord terminates by saying, I am the Lord their God. 
it is within the covenant between God and man that he reveals himself to his people for one and only objective, that they may worship him. Going by this then, the true reinforcer of covenant with God appears to be the worshipping of him. For the Lord to say that he would be their God, commonly assigns the essence of a divine promise within his covenant with his people. And for the divine nature of his covenant to be sustained there must be worship. The present-day church can be at an advantage to learn much about Jehovah as being the God of covenant by examining his covenant relationship with Israel during the wilderness experience. In the book of Leviticus, the Lord eloquently and most repeatedly praises the banner of holiness to the extent that the word holy appears much more frequently in that book than any other book in the Bible. This was a deliberate attempt by the Lord to draw Israel into a lasting covenant with him. In one such occasion, the Lord decrees, I am the Lord who brought you out of Egypt to be your God, therefore be holy because I am holy. We see very clearly here that the Lord reminds them of the covenant he had with Jacob to remove Israel from Egypt, and yet the undercurrents of that covenant are well anchored on holiness. Israel was hence to be completely consecrated and set apart for the Lord and her holiness was intended by the Lord to be expressed in every aspect of her life. So it is with the church today, that because of who God is, and what he has done to offer us Jesus Christ the Redeemer on the cross, we must dedicate ourselves fully to him in absolute holiness. God's absolute moral virtue is a presence that is so infinitely pure that it unmasks and judges every moral flaw in our hearts, minds and the faults of our deeds. Exodus 6 verse 7, Exodus 29, 45-46, Leviticus 11 verse 45, Leviticus 20 verse 33, Leviticus 25 verse 38, Leviticus 26 verse 12, Leviticus 26 verse 45, Numbers 15 verse 41, Deuteronomy 29 verse 13, Jeremiah 24 verse 7, Ezekiel 24, 30 to 31, Ezekiel 36 verse 28, Ezekiel 37 verse 27, Hosea 1, 9 to 10, Hosea 11 verse 20. 2 Corinthians 6 verse 16, Hebrews 8 verse 10, Revelations 21 verse 3. In all these cases, faithfulness and righteousness are at the center stage of the covenant of favor and blessings, implying that God Almighty is longing for a church that displays a greater level of dependability and holiness, as assisted by the Holy Spirit. Biblical Scroll in that way, every time a prophet was sent, the Lord always prevailed upon him to document the visions of his calling. Documentation therefore has been a very central part of the calling and the office of the envoys that Jehovah entrusts. By extension then, literacy was a must in order to facilitate the Lord's documentation in such an office. Among the documents that have been employed by the Lord the scroll has featured most prominently. In order to well perceive the value of the scroll, it is very crucial to outline the content of the message therein. The scroll in itself is one such document that has traversed both the dispensations of the Old and New Testaments. Unveiling the scroll of God in heaven, and its hidden secrets decreed therein by his authority, requires an exploration of the nature of writings that scrolls have routinely carried. In the Bible, the scrolls in which the prophets downloaded their most sacred and holy visions, consisted of a long strip of leather or papyrus on which, like scribes, they wrote in columns. The structure of the literature on the scroll was very systematic and orderly because it consisted of the name of the author and the date of the writing. The writings themselves though, were done using an ink pen. Going to the technology of the time, 
The formulation of the ink routinely involved taking lamp black from burning lamps and slightly dissolving in water. The pen that was used to execute the writing was often an ordinary ink pen such as the one with which the Lord commanded Isaiah to write, by saying, The Lord said to me, Take a large scroll and write on it with an ordinary pen, Mayor, Shalel Hash Bass. And I will call in Uriah the priest and Zechariah son of Jebrekiah as reliable witnesses for me. Isaiah 8 verse 1 what was particularly most fascinating about the scroll is that even an ordinary pen could be employed to document its contents. This goes a long way to emphasize that it may not have been very critical of what quality slash cotter of pen was used in recording a scroll, but most important was its content. Furthermore, the Hebrew word for scroll is found to relate very closely to the word unsealed copy implying that the content of a scroll was always intended for a future read. It was meant to be available in the future for which purpose the recording were done. The scroll, unsealed copy was always for ready reference, the authenticity of which would then be guaranteed by the sealed copy, if the unsealed deed should be lost, damaged or changed accidentally, deliberately or otherwise. The scroll consisted of two spindles on which the papyrus or leather was rolled. After being rolled up, a scroll was often sealed to protect its contents. Different scrolls had different sizes, including those like that of the prophet Isaiah which measured up to 30 feet. Inside the scrolls were written the ordinances of the Lord that covered the following broad areas. A. Covenant of God. B. Judgment of God. C. Blessings of God. Nonetheless, there was always the high risk of losing the content of the scrolls through the awful process of deterioration. Many times the ink used to write the scroll got blotted out when touched by rain or got in contact with water. That created a critical need to always maintain an untouched sealed copy of the scroll for cross-referencing. The reading of the scroll though, always involved a clumsy process of holding one spindle with one hand while rolling it open with the other hand, on the second spindle. That ensured that the content of the scroll was read in the chronological order of God's revelation. Given its gravity, it became absolutely imperative for the teachers of the law to ensure that the entire community remembered the contents of a written scroll, especially as it related to them and their destiny. The scroll then served as a form of memorabilia, though this time around it contained what the Lord had decreed for the people. For example, Exodus 17 verse 14. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this on a scroll as something to be remembered and make sure that Joshua hears it, because I will completely blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. The reading of a scroll was a very serious undertaking of such magnitude and gravity, that it called for the attention of the priest and the king together with his palace officials. And when a scroll was read, fear gripped the people because the words were of God Almighty himself. Many times people that heard the scroll being read, toward their robes in an act of repentance and fear. Jeremiah 36 verse 4 So Jeremiah called Barak son of Neriah. And while Jeremiah dictated all the words the Lord had spoken to him, Barak wrote them on the scroll. Jeremiah 36, 11 to 17 When Micaiah son of Jemriah the son of Shaphan, heard all the words of the Lord from the scroll, he went down to the secretary's room in the royal palace, where all the officials were sitting, Elishama the secretary, Delaih son of Shemaih, Elnathan son of Asibir, Jemriah son of Shaphan, Zedekiah son of Hanaya and all the other officials. 
After Micaiah told them everything he had heard Barak read to the people from the scroll, all the officials sent Jehudi son of Nethaniah, the son of Shalamiah, son of Cushi, to say to Barak, Bring the scroll from which you have read to the people and come. So Barak son of Neriah went to them with the scroll in his hand. They said to him, Sit down, please, and read it to us. So Barak read it to them. When they heard all these words, they looked at each other in fear and said to Barak, We must report all these words to the king. Then they asked Barak, Tell us, how did you come to write all this? Did Jeremiah dictate it? Yes, Barak replied, he dictated all these words to me, and I wrote them in ink on the scroll. Further on, the above mentioned officials were obligated to report what they had heard read from the scroll to the king. And you see that the king himself also called for the scroll to be read in his presence. The scroll was a very revered piece of document that contained the oracles of God regarding the people and their destiny. For the case of Jeremiah the prophet, Barak his assistant was appointed by the Lord to undertake the process of writing the scroll. Jeremiah hence dictated as Barak wrote the scroll using a pen and ink. Those writings indeed changed the destiny of Israel forever. When the Lord spoke the words in Jeremiah 31 verse 33, it essentially marked the historic moment in which he foretold of the advent of the Messiah and the depletion of the utility of the physical scrolls which were made of papyrus and leather. Jeremiah 31 verse 33 says, This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel. After that time, declares the Lord, I will put my law in their mind and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. Vision of the Scroll Right at the center of the throne in heaven, is the scroll of God Almighty. And unlike all the other scrolls aforementioned, the scroll of God Almighty in heaven is a well-guarded secret, whose hidden content has been decreed by God as the blueprint for the redemption of mankind. It was in the morning of July 11, 2005, when the Lord visited me in a very historic way. In that mighty vision, God Almighty lifted me up into heaven and I saw the tremendous and most stunning glory of the Lord that is around the throne. The glory of God that I saw around the throne was so brilliant that it was indeed blinding. As I stood right before the throne of God Almighty, I then heard the deliberation of He that sat on the throne, over the fate of the nations of the earth. It was at that moment that the Lord God brought me into the Spirit, back to the earth. And the voice said, Let me show you what is about to happen to the earth. While still in the vision, I found myself standing at a location on the earth. Then I saw two angels sent from heaven to the earth. Before their departure from heaven, the angel that was on the right hand side as I looked up into heaven, was given the scroll and then I realized that he that stood on his left hand side, with immense glory all over him, was actually the Lord. The angel on my left hand side as I faced heaven showed me the scroll of God in heaven and the seal on the scroll that had been broken by the Lord. The scroll I saw was partially opened. After that, then I found myself standing right before the angel that had shown me the scroll whose seal was broken, and the Lord. As the angel began to describe to me the events that would soon befall the nations of the earth, the Lord stood by, on my right hand side. In this vision, I then saw the angel of the Lord flying from heaven towards the earth. It was my very first time to have ever witnessed the angel of the Lord flying right from heaven towards the earth. It is indeed a very stunning moment to behold. I saw the angel crisscross the earth and a tremendous historic destruction befell and struck the earth with such awe. 
and then the Spirit of the Lord lifted me up and took me across the entire earth and I saw lots of debris that was left behind from the destruction that had hit the earth. It rated from massive historic earthquakes, tsunamis, floods, fires, droughts, wars, accidents, name it. Then the voice of the Lord spoke from heaven saying, Tell this people to prepare for the coming of the Lord. At that time, I woke up and was in very very great shock and fear of what was about to befall the earth. It took some time for me to recover and begin to understand what had just happened in that historic vision. From that day on I looked at the earth very differently, very well knowing what was just about to befall them. I then began to proclaim the coming of a huge destruction and the imminent return of the Messiah. Ever since then, the Lord has then spoken with me about Hurricane Katrina which came to pass in a record one month and nine days, the Haiti earthquake, Chile earthquake, Pakistani earthquake, Iranian earthquake, Russian earthquake, Greek earthquake, the Great North earthquake from Central America Mexico into California, New Zealand earthquake, the Samoan earthquake and tsunami. Indonesian earthquakes and tsunamis, volcanic eruptions among others. Certainly, the earth has seen its greater share of destruction, death and debris ever since the prophecy of the opening of the scroll was released. The scroll of God in heaven. When the Lord Jesus sat by the hillside of the Mount of Olives, and released that most central Olivet prophecy, he without a doubt opened up the deepest secrets of heaven to the church. It also became the most pivotal place at which the church has ever sat in her entire history, because on that day it undeniably tipped the scale in favor of the kingdom of God. Going to the depth of revelation accompanying this Mount of Olives prophecy, there is no doubt that God has certainly loved the church they under the testimony of that unmerited love to the church arises from the fact that the revelation correlating to this principal prophecy is actually located inside the scroll of God that is sealed in heaven. When John appeared to have committed a fatal error of omission by not recording the Olivet prophecy in his account of the glorious gospel, it later turns out that this was as a matter of fact, a deliberate act of God Almighty. Jehovah had already made up his mind from time immemorial, that when the fullness of time dawned, Apostle John would be set apart and prepared in order to receive the revelation on the Olivet Discourse. The revelation on the Olivet Discourse offers an exact translation of every single prophecy key that the Lord Jesus elaborated on the Mount of Olives, into the current dispensation. Today, the church can well perceive the importance of the tearing of the curtain that separated the holy and most holy place upon the crucifixion of Jesus. That tearing literally symbolized Christ opening the way directly to God in the most holy place. The mystery surrounding the nature of God registers well with the confinement of John at Batmos Island as the place at which to receive this most noble revelation of God. 2 Corinthians 3 verse 3. You show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone but on tablets of human hearts. With the words of this scripture, God Almighty decided to move the church from the physical realm into a spiritual realm. Known as the disciple whom Jesus loved most, John was lavish with the privilege of receiving this landmark revelation which he recorded in the book of Revelation chapter 6. The spiritual scroll of God in heaven contains the blueprint that defines the means of entry into heaven for the church. Like baptism which is the outward sign of the inward work of grace, so is the Olivet prophecy the outward presentation of the deeper writings inside the scroll of God. While Revelation chapter 1, 
2 and 3 dwell mainly on the subject of repentance and the preparing of the way for the coming Messiah. Revelation chapter 4 on the other hand unveils the spiritual structure of the throne of God in heaven. Revelation chapter 5 on the other hand gives a serious account on the scroll of God in heaven. The classic case on the authority bestowed upon the Lord Jesus at Calvary is the fact that he alone was found worthy to take the scroll from the Father's right hand and to open its seals. The scroll of God in heaven has seven seals that essentially denote the prophetic timeline of God on the earth. Just as were the seals of the Old Testament scrolls broken in order to access the covenant of God, so it is in heaven today. However, the breaking of the seals of the scroll of God in heaven is the most critical event whose enormous impact has the power to rapidly mature the earth towards the coming of the Messiah. Of the seven seals on the scroll of God, only the first four are critical for the Church of Christ to enter into the rapture. It is the breaking of the first four seals of the scroll of God in heaven that constitute the fulfillment of the prophecy of the four apocalyptic horsemen. Each of the four horsemen of the apocalypse fulfills a specific prophecy key that the Lord Jesus spoke while seated on the hillside of the Mount of Olives. The eloquence of their release is determined by the order of God in the zero countdown towards rapture. When the first of the seven seals of the scroll of God is broken, the white apocalyptic horse is released into the church. This horseman has been coined spiritual deception because of the false Christianity that he establishes in the church, outside of holiness. When the Lamb of God breaks the second seal of the scroll in heaven, the fiery red horseman is released whose effects are wars in Iraq, Afghanistan, Somalia, Mexico, DR Congo, Pakistan, Colombia, Iran, among others. Prophecy Keys The Mount of Olives at which the Lord gave these most important pronouncements is a ridge that rises about 200 feet above the city of Jerusalem, and is approximately more than a mile long beyond the Kidron Valley. Sitting on a rock by this mountainside, the Lord Jesus began to delve into the landmark question that the disciples had privately raised before him, when they asked, When will this happen and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? As the Lord deals with this question, the description of his response to them literally gives birth to the milestone Mount of Olive prophecy. This most important discourse in the entire Bible appears to be framed mainly between verses 4 and 14 of the 24th chapter of the glorious Gospel of Matthew. Nevertheless, a quick glance at the Olivet prophecy immediately reveals that it is largely taken up with strong warnings and sharp exhortations for the church to live responsibly, and courageously despite the tumult of that dispensation, right before his return in the rapture. It however also flags the true litmus test for the faith of those aspiring to be part of the glorious kingdom of God because it exalts the uncertainty about the exact time of Christ's return. Other than present an impediment to the faith of the Christian believers, this uncertainty, as a matter of fact, highly encourages responsible living and alertness, while totally discouraging irresponsible casualness with the hard-won grace of God. The last part of the Olivet Discourse though, contains several introspective parables that send an unmistakable message on the requirements of the kingdom of God. Not one stone. The first prophecy key that the Lord discharged, is the one in which he described the horrific destruction that would befall the temple buildings. In this prophecy key, the Lord was alluding to the shattering fall and destruction that would visit the Church of Christ in the days prior to his return in the rapture. In order to envision the magnitude of the fall that the Lord was referring to, one needs to make reference to the destruction and demolition of the temple buildings by both the Babylonians and the Romans.
under the leadership of Nebuchadnezzar and Titus, respectively. It was such a destruction that was characterized with the setting of the temple building on fire and the merciless tumbling down of every piece of rock that had held the temple buildings together. The brutality of that vandalism was seen in the detail with which they knocked down and overturned every single rock in order to pry out every little piece of gold. The gifts of gold had been used to decorate the pillars of the temple buildings and its most superior interior sections. The vandals literally took individual stones of the building blocks and roasted them on fire in order to melt out every slightest of gold that had earlier adorned those temple buildings. The demolition was so great that they endeavored to collect every little gold leaf that melted from the roof. When the fullness of time came to pass, this prophecy key has been fulfilled in the most stunning fashion ever. The despondency and hopelessness that today define the church are the true manifestation of the fulfillment of this prophecy key as discharged by the Lord Jesus. In Revelation chapter 6, we see the release of the four apocalyptic horsemen whose entourage spells doom to the church of Christ let alone the nations. And just to put into perspective the gravity of what the Lord implied in this prophecy key, when he asserted that not one stone would be left on another, it would be prudent to examine the state of the church today. The tumbling of stones with not one left on another, essentially meant the total bringing down and destruction of the structure. It also meant that the key structures that held the house together would be the primary targets of the destroyer. Today, we can clearly see that the breaking of the first of the seven seals on the scroll of God in heaven, having led to the release of the wide apocalyptic horsemen, indeed brought down the church. Hence, the Lord was in this prophecy key pointing towards an eminent conquest that would descend over the church to the extent that the main holding structures would be the first to give way. The Lord Jesus had earlier on declared his position very clearly to the effect that the church of Christ is built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And if this is anything to go by, then clarity can now be attained on how the adversary thoroughly targeted these two most important ministries in order for the house to succumb. Because the prophet's ministry is the conduit, communication portal, and the voice of the Lord, then with certainty, this is what the adversary targeted and demolished in order to get his leeway. The adversary knows it too well that once the channels of communication with God have been knocked out, then he can sell anything to the church and she would readily buy into it. The current horizontal, earthly gospel of prosperity that lacks in holiness, is the true evidence that the days Jesus talked about, are here. This defunct worldly gospel that is today being fronted by the priesthood, has become so outdated that even non-believers are cognizant. The Lord knew that the first of the four horsemen of the apocalypse is the most deleterious because a deceived church is one that has been led astray. Where being led astray implies taking another route whose destination is different from heaven. Being led astray also implies that the walker who toes the path is in absolute comfort and not even aware that the route they walk is a path to destruction. Such a body of Christ can often be seen and heard eloquently reciting scriptures and exuding enormous confidence. In this kind of condition surely, not one stone remains standing on another. The first horseman of the apocalypse whose name is spiritual deception is indeed a conqueror who is bent on conquest as he comes to fully bring to pass the noble words of our Lord Jesus on the Mount of Olives. Just as his name spelled out right from the onset of his discharge, this horseman puts a spin into this prophecy key and literally beat the church hands down. The false prophets that maraud the church today, coupled with the false apostles, and the great immorality among Christians, 
secularism and casual lukewarm church that is today the hallmark of salvation are just but a few presentations of a body of Christ with not one stone left on another. Watch out! The Lord instructed the church to watch out because Christ's return, the risk of a bitter conflict with the world, and threat of eternal death, would have everlasting consequences upon her life. That admonition was meant to designate a season prior to the eminent return of the Messiah when the church would have to approach her crossroads. At that junction, the Christian believers would have to repent or perish. It is apparent that such a directive as watch out, were meant to imply that in the days prior to the rapture, the church would have to be on guard. Resultant thereto, one of the chief reasons as to why the Olivet Discourse was launched was the need that the Lord knew would arise to alert the church on the dangers of deception. While the disciples may have thought that the destruction of the physical temple in Jerusalem was the event being referred to here, they would later be very shocked to realize that the Lord was indeed referring to the destruction of the spiritual tabernacle. The heart is a spiritual temple of the Holy Spirit hence the need to jealously guard her significance of this prophecy key is greatly instructed by the fact that the Lord Jesus was denoting that a claim on salvation would arise in these last days, which would be launched by the adversary. Today, we can vividly witness the unfolding of this significant prophecy key, courtesy of the decay that has made its way into the altar of the Lord. The body of Christ has not heeded the call to be watchful and instead has gotten entangled with the very sin that the Lord cautioned her about. The failure to adhere to a presage of this nature, is what has today caused the servants of the Lord to lose their calling and anointing. The principal view surrounding this stern caution of watchfulness is based on the secrecy of that day and hour of Christ's return. That is the reason the Lord instructed therefore keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour Matthew 24 verse 36. It appears as though the risk of plunder allotted onto the latter anointing of this hour is much higher than that allocated at Pentecost. Ultimately, how much one watches out on the anointing of the Holy Spirit bestowed upon their lives is what will reveal whether or not one is saved. And the purpose of such a benchmark will be to determine who should be allowed to enter the kingdom of the saved and who will be consigned to eternal punishment. It is the failure to observe a serene watchfulness that has led the majority of the born against saints astray. Wars and rumors The endless escalation of conflicts across the globe significantly echo the words Jesus proclaimed in the Olivet Prophecy. That prophecy advances to broad types of wars, namely the wars entailing conflicts within a country and those that involve nation against nation. It is the breaking of the second seal of the scroll of God that essentially triggered off this historic bloodshed across the earth. Currently, there are wars ongoing across the globe, in fulfillment to the predictions that the Lord gave in the Olivet Prophecy. One category of wars is that which covers the war in Iraq, the war in Afghanistan, the war in South Korea, the constant threat of war between Venezuela and Colombia, to mention. On the other hand, the internal conflicts include the war in Somalia, the war against drug gangs in Mexico, the war in the Democratic Republic of Congo, the post-election mayhem in Kenya, the war in Pakistan the war against the Tamil Tigers in Sri Lanka, and others. The rider of the fiery red horse of the apocalypse is today crisscrossing the earth while brewing up conflict because he has been given power from the throne of God to take away peace from all men. Revelation 6 verse 4 His large sword is today tainted with a lot of blood and fat arising from the butchering of the nations that he is involved in. The color red denotes the bloodshed and bloodbath that the Lord Jesus hinted would soak the earth in the days prior to his return. 
coupled with these wars, have come a tremendous wave of the rumors and fear of wars. These rumors of wars have taken up the form of the war on terrorism. Today, it is common to watch on news broadcasts a statement from terrorist organizations warning of the impending attacks. Such messages have created a global fear going to rumors of wars that the Lord foretold would appear in these last days. The War on Terrorism the war in Iraq and the war in Afghanistan have fundamentally recruited almost all the nations of the earth into a war stance in fulfillment to those words spoken at the hillside of the Mount of Olives. When the Lord Jesus requested the church to ensure that she stays calm in the midst of such horrific bloodletting, it became a blessed assurance to the holy believers. The serene quiet and still that the Lord was suggesting to the church can only be achieved through the works of the Holy Spirit in tranquilizing man's anxiety. With the words, but see to it that you are not alarmed, the Lord essentially trivialized the tumult and distress of this hour in the hearts of the Christians. However, when the Lord says that the end is yet to come, he literally implies the breaking of the seven seals which define the end. It must be said, though, that only the first four seals are critical for the rapture of the church. Among the other prophecy keys that are noteworthy in the Olivet prophecy, are the persecution of the day, apostasy, increase in wickedness, and the gospel of the kingdom being preached to the ends of the earth. Today's Earthquakes the earthquakes of today were prophesied when the Lord Jesus pronounced the Olivet Prophecy. In Matthew 24 verse 7 the Lord said, There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. This was a very important indicator that the Lord placed on the timeline towards the rapture of the church. It is amazing that in these last days the magnitudes of earthquakes have become historic to the extent that devastation is totally alarming. Considering the most recent prophecies regarding of the coming of respective earthquakes, it becomes significant to note one common baseline with them all. Right before the Asian tsunami of December 26, 2004 The Lord sent me to warn the nations of the earth to repent and turn away from Eastern religions, on November 24, 2004. This was exactly one month before that prophecy was fulfilled on December 26, 2004. And just like the prophecy laid it to bear, it was historic as has never been seen before. On July 20, 2005, I gave the prophecy of the Hurricane Katrina that would come and humble the U.S., and especially New Orleans if they did not repent from sexual sin, the gospel of prosperity, false prophecies, name it. That prophecy was fulfilled exactly one month and nine days later on August 29, 2005. On March 25th. Saturday and March 26, Sunday 2006, at night Hamra in Karyan, I prophesied both the Iranian and Russian earthquakes. And it took only five days and that prophecy was fulfilled on Friday March 31, 2006 when historic cascades of earthquake struck western Iran including the devastation of the city of Loristan. Among other earthquakes that the Lord has sent me to prophesy include the Pakistani earthquake, the Great North Earthquake from Mexico, to California, Arizona and Nevada. The most recent New Zealand earthquake whose prophecy was given in Brisbane, Australia on August 4, 2010 and also on August 29, 2010, and fulfilled on September 3, 2010. The horrific Haiti earthquake whose prophecy the Lord sent me to pronounce on November 22-29, 2009 and came to pass on January 12, 2010. The Chile earthquake whose prophecy I gave on January 19-24, 2009 and got fulfilled on February 27, 2010.
Malawi earthquake, etc. The basic common denominator of all these earthquakes is that God is demanding for repentance in the church and across the nations of the earth. This repentance is meant to prepare the way for the coming of the Messiah across the four ends of the earth. The Lord is looking for a holy bride for the coming of the wedding of the Lamb. Vision of the Black Horse Revelation 6, 5-6 says, When the Lamb opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come. I looked. And there before me was a black horse. Its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand. Then I heard what sounded like a voice among the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a day's wages, and three quarts of barley for a day's wages, and do not damage the oil and the wine. The black horse of the apocalypse and its rider designates the onset of a horrific dispensation of dispiriting famine that institutes a despicable loathsomeness and repugnant form of despair and death across the entire earth. The release of the rider of the black horse was prophesied following the vision of August 19, 2008, and its public proclamation on Saturday, August 23. 2008 and Sunday August 24, 2008 at a mighty revival meeting in Nakuru, Kenya. In that prophecy, I said, Listen to me the nations of the earth, listen to me heaven. I have seen the release of the black horse from heaven and the coming of a global famine and economic distress. It is in Revelation chapter 6. Barely two months from when I proclaimed that prophecy. Did the global community witness one of the most horrendous economic meltdown of their lifetime? It was on October 7, 2008 that the global financial markets obeyed every word of the voice of God and all the financial markets across the globe crashed in the most historic episode ever witnessed since their inception. The release of the black horse therefore brings forth the horrendous suffering into the households. Because the rider of the black horse carries a scale, i.e. a balance beam, his release definitely bespeaks a crisis in the global commerce, trade, buying and selling, and economy. It is as though the Lord ushered all the global economies into the able hands of the rider of the black horse thereby throwing the nations of the earth at the mercy of this wild horseman. Dual Prophecy it is now absolutely evident that at the discharge of the rider of the black horse from heaven, the Lord God Almighty released the dual prophecy. To best understand this conversation that is the crueling at throne of God Almighty in heaven, and its repercussions on the earth, it is advisable to split the object of this heavenly discourse into two forms, the physical and spiritual implications. The first half of this dual prophecy underscores its impact in the physical realm by putting in place a horrific famine in which one quart of wheat goes for a whole day's wages. Considering that people go to work to feed their families and households, then what emerges out vividly clear is that in the earthly realm, the rider of the black horse essentially gets underway, the food scarcity of astronomical proportions. Such food scarcity has been witnessed globally ever since the onset of the fulfillment of this prophecy took root. As a matter of fact, if one thought that the horrific global hunger observed in late 2008 and early 2009 was that bad, then one is absolutely stunned to realize that even in this 2010, the UN, FAO has already sounded an alarm on the global food situation. The situation developing in places like Pakistan following the recent horrific floods are just but a recipe for a historic and most agonizing famine down the line. In the aftermath of the Haiti earthquake, the global community has watched in utter disbelief when formerly self-sufficient farmers and working class of Haiti got clumped into dilapidated conditions of refugee camps, awaiting food handouts.
if that does not consign a horrendous famine looming within the horizon, then what does? The war in the Democratic Republic of Congo that has seen many women raped in masses has in itself rendered families hungry for years on end. Considering that women in Africa offer the backbone for agricultural farming, then it only befits to project that a larger portion of the DR Congo has absconded from food production. The perennial unrelenting war in Somalia has fundamentally humiliated an entire nation into a hungry begging stance that doesn't seem to have an immediate solution coming its way. The agony of hunger and starvation that is currently being witnessed in North Korea remains to be unveiled due to the secrecy of their communist government. The truth though, is that millions and millions of North Koreans have perished due to hunger and starvation. Having said this, the battle lines seem to have been well drawn by the writer of the Black Horse to the extent that now he is at liberty to transduce the impact of his presence on the earth as the nation's witness. Global famine, global economic recession, global unemployment, the collapse of the Greek economy, the French national strikes that paralyzed transportation baking, and every aspect of the economy. The historic budget cuts in the United Kingdom that has caused every household to tighten their belts and pull up their socks. Horrific unemployment in the U.S., the mortgage crisis in the U.S., the injection of stimulus packages into the U.S. and other economies, and the redemption of Wall Street from a most humiliating collapse that would have led to a permanent change in the global markets. Right now in November 2010, the G20 Group of Nations are holding a very crucial meeting in the city of Seoul, South Korea, in which they are actually scheduled to discuss the viability of the U.S. dollar as the global currency. Due to the tumultuous effects of the rider of the black horse, the U.S. dollar has lost value to the extent that many nations are now beginning to lose confidence in its application as a global medium of exchange. As a matter of fact, because of the effects of this black horse, there is a currency war brewing between the U.S. and China that which the U.S. is accusing China for undervaluing her currency in order to boost export. When the Lord Jesus proclaimed at that hillside of the Mount of Olives that, there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. It is the phrase various places that served to demarcate the boundaries of extreme food scarcity and surplus. Hence, on the other side of the coin of the physical realm of this Olivet prophecy, beams global food surplus. When the Lord Jesus said that there would be famines in various places, he fundamentally implied that not the entire face of the earth would experience that despicable band of famine. But numerous localities would be visited by a loathsome famine. That also, by inference, implied that there are zones on the earth that would enjoy the protection of the Lord even in the advent of the rider of the black horse. In the physical realm then, when God the Father spoke from his throne in heaven and gave a standing order of decree to the rider of the black horse that even as he went about his mission on the earth, he should not touch the oil and the wine. That by implication means that the rider of the black horse was given a strict marching order at which he was also sent to safeguard the oil and the wine. Oil and wine biblically symbolizes plenty. Thence, the holy clamor by the Lord for the rider of the black horse to not damage the oil and the wine, is a command that set the limits on the destruction that he could unleash. It is today common knowledge that the roots of the olives and vines go much deeper into the soil and tap the underground moistures hence they would not be damaged by the onset of drought. No wonder. As the Greek economy collapses, and the French economy trembles, the South Korean economy is on the contrary witnessed some of the highest growth in its own history. The Israeli economy has also witnessed some of the highest growth ever since the inception of the State of Israel.
It is amazing that the Chinese, Indian, Singaporean, Malaysian, Taiwanese economies have instead witnessed tremendous growth while the Western economies have headed south. Spiritual Realm The Kingdom of God is a spiritual domain at which all matters are realized in the spiritual realm. Even though the dual prophecy pronounced at the onset of the rider of the black horse may have had some physical bearing, the central matter though was how those physical manifestations of its fulfillment realize in the spiritual realm. In the spiritual realm, the prophecy of the release of the black horse pointed at the dispensation in which there would be two phases animating in the body of Christ. The depiction of famine in that prophecy implies extreme spiritual desolation that would consume the Church of Christ in some locations while the oil and wine reflects the part of the body of Christ that would see excessive revival. It is true today that the body of Christ has witnessed a horrendous spiritual famine at which the Holy Word of God is very scarce. Famous 8, 11-12 the spiritual starvation and hunger has today befallen the church, has now reached very desperate proportions at which the hungry sheep are now even getting angrier because of the dwindling levels at which any real spiritual food is trickling down to them. It is a real state of starvation that is starting to not look good in the physical sense. There is so much desperation to the extent that anything goes. The devil has exploited this spiritual hunger to the max, up to the point whereby false apostles and false pastors who sell small bottles of olive oil in the church, are experiencing a booming business because the sheep are crying for anything that they can take in to fill their empty spiritual stomachs. Like it is in the physical realm when a ravaging famine strikes a land causing people to eat carcasses of dead animals, pick wild even poisonous berries and boil while decanting water severally, so it is in the spiritual realm, when now the sheep of Christ have to make do with anything available in the name of spiritual food. A devastating spiritual famine of this order is what the rider of the black horse was sent to set up across the face of the earth. Today the gospel of prosperity which came from the devil, and lacking in any form of holiness, is what has ravaged the church. It has become the biggest curse ever to visit the church in her whole lifetime. It is totally unimaginable that at such a last minute to the return of the Messiah rapture the peddlers of this false gospel of prosperity are busy promising the church the financial wealth transfer from the world into the sanctuary. Instead of preparing the church in absolute righteousness and holiness, this false pastors, false apostles, false prophets, false evangelists, false teachers have all ganged up to defile the church by masquerading as messengers of God's blessings. Yet indeed, we all know it too well that the blessings of God must always draw the church towards the kingdom of God and not towards a more worldly sinful living. So bad is the hunger that some of the pastors and sheep across the globe are now selling water from the Jordan River, prayer shawls, soil from Israel, pieces of their so-called cross, books on financial anointing, books on psychology etc. There is a fully-fledged famine raging on in the church in fulfillment of the prophecy of the rider of the black horse. Likewise in the spiritual realm, when God the Father decreed that the oil and wine must be safeguarded in this advent of the black horse, it literally meant a part of the body of Christ that is undergoing revival. The safeguard is very crucial at this hour because the anointing that pervades the church now is fundamentally meant to prepare the church in absolute righteousness for the coming of the Messiah. There is a lot at stake right now because the anointing of the Holy Spirit that is depicted by the oil and wine is actually that biblically most anticipated latter glory of the Holy Spirit into the church. Furthermore, by assigning the rider of the black horse to safeguard the oil and wine church. 
the Lord God was primarily implying that there would be a high risk of plunder by the adversary on the carriers of that latter end time glory. In the spiritual realm of the kingdom of God, oil symbolizes the flow of the anointing of the Holy Spirit while the wine represents the strength of that flow of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And because the church has entered into the last days prior to the rapture, then it becomes absolutely clear that the oil and wine basically represent the most glorious promised latter anointing into the church. Oil and Wine Church When the prophets of the Old Testament saw the visions of God regarding this hour in the church, most of them wept bitterly because they longed that they would have looked to the dramatics of this dispensation. They had seen the visions of the coming of the Messiah and they had seen that chief among the Messiah's stripes, was that he would crush death. Incredibly so, even as they scribed on their scrolls regarding the advent of the Messiah. One thing stood out prominently, that the coming of the Messiah would usher in a dispensation of a massive outpour of the Holy Spirit. These messengers of God Almighty greatly marvel and seriously trembled at the visions of the Holy Spirit and the authority and power with which His coming would be registered. Scrolls have been written in honor of the Holy Spirit and His most anticipated role in glorifying the Blessed One of Israel. One thing that towered super high in the ink and pen writings of the scrolls was the would-be role of the church as the vehicle of that most glorious Holy Spirit visitation. This is what caused a stir among the prophets because they then knew that Emmanuel would shift the peril dim on human existence and appraise mankind as the dwelling of God. The prophet Isaiah for instance crowned that dispensation Isaiah 26, 19-21. Here the prophet Isaiah registers the celebration of the Holy Spirit in the celestial kingdom of God. His manuscripts underscores the supremacy of Christ on the cross and how that atoning for sins would crush the fangs of death to the extent that her sting would be no more. However, the inauguration of the kingdom of God would be marked by the morning dew whose task is to institute the authority of Christ over death by resurrecting the dead church. Incredibly, the Holy Spirit then prepares the church for presentation as a glorious priestly bride in the wedding feast of our high priest. It is such visions that caused a lot of blessed anxiety in the hearts of the messengers as they began to exalt the Holy Spirit and the glorious dispensation. Hence, we see that way back in the Old Testament, there was already a high appreciation allocated to the oil and wine of this day. When the Lord Jesus himself spoke about the wedding of the Lamb of God, he gave a parable of ten virgins five of whom were white showing to the oil and wine. To God Almighty in heaven, salvation is an all-or-nothing phenomenon. And that being the case, then we see that entry into rapture becomes a preserve of the wise virgins of the oil and wine stature. This is because the oil and wine church that the rider of the black horse is directed to preserve, is a church that walks in wisdom which essentially designates the fear of the Lord in the life of the Christians. The fear of the Lord is surely the impetus for living a holy and righteous life Matthew 25, 1-13 The conferment of Christ-like character in the church is the calling of the oil and wine in the church. The present-day Church of Christ therefore needs to do all she can to submit into the noble will of the Lord in order that he may transform her into the oil and wine sanctuary. The unity of faith that is a requirement in the perfect Bride of Christ can only be attained by intercession of the oil and wine in the Church. Evidenced by the tight group covenant they maintain by watching over each other and raising accountability to one another. The five wise virgins offer the perfect model of the unity of faith. Ravenous Fire It is God's will to restore His people to the proper covenant relationship with Him. 
This quest by the Lord to restore back the fallen church of the remnant thus reveals God's mercy in the midst of disobedience and desolation. Zechariah 13, 8-9 says. In the whole land, declares the Lord, two-thirds will be struck down and perish, yet one-third will be left in it. This third I will bring into the fire. I will refine them like silver and test them like gold. They will call on my name and I will answer them. I will say, they are my people, and they will say, the Lord is our God. The primary objective of the latter anointing of oil and wine is none other than to purify the church into the acceptable standard of Christ's stature. The purification of the church will assuredly generate a remnant church at the end of the production line. This is because the church has been ordained to walk the narrow path that leads into the kingdom of God, and shun the broad way that ends up in hell. In this respect, the oil and the wine in the church avails the privilege of the saints to possess the rightful discernment of the ways of God in these perilous days. It is the wisdom of God within the oil and wine that permits the church to locate and identify the narrow path that leads to the kingdom of God. Many Christians today find themselves in an awkward place at which they are living the casual life like the heathen. That condition is a complete distortion of God's plan for the church hence calling for the refiner's fire to help perfection the saints into spiritual maturity before it gets too late. Leviticus 23, 23-25 Rosh Hashanah is the Jewish New Year that is celebrated world over. In order to commemorate the end of one season and the beginning of another, it is the only Jewish festival that is received with a massive drum that blasts of biblical proportions. This Rosh Hashanah festivities are marked with a great feasting and the arraying of various special foods and drinks. This splendid celebration was commanded as an occasion to be marked as a lasting ordinance between Israel and Jehovah her Creator. Astonishingly, it is this very festival that indeed foretold the coming of the Messiah in the glorious rapture. The synonym between the two arises from the fact that they must be greeted with drum that blasts. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16-17 However, clearly catalogued in this Rosh Hashanah commemoration is the central role played by the oil and wine in presenting the appropriate holy sacrifice at rapture. There is indeed a very significant role of the oil and wine in the church in order that she may be able to present the right offering made to the Lord by fire. The oil and wine dispensation that the church has today walked into comes with the fire of the Holy Spirit. And it is the fire of the Holy Spirit that literally burns the sin and decay in the church, thereby leading only the threshed wheat into the barn's sanctuary up to now. The Church of Christ has accumulated so much dross within her fiber, a sinful condition that has to be purged off by the obliterating power of the fire of the Holy Spirit. Matthew 3, 11-12 says, I baptize you with water for repentance. But after me will come one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not fit to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire.